Welcome to Hot Topics. We have a subject today that uh, I've received a number of questions on uh, pertaining to ground fault protection of equipment. Now, uh, we will be discussing 230.95A and uh, through C, 240.13, 210.13, and 215.10. But before we get into this in any depth, mainly uh, reviewing 230.95A through C with the four notes that are listed in C part, we pick up really the rules for ground fault protection of equipment uh, in detail. Uh, if we have a feeder, we have to go over and look at 215.10 on page 72 of the code. 230. Two, excuse me, 230.95 uh, is on page 96. I don't know if I mentioned that or not. And then you want to look at uh, uh, branch circuits. And uh, is ground fault protection ever required on a branch circuit? That's a question we get quite a bit. And of course, that's in 210.13. And 210.13 is on page 65 of the NEC. And of course, uh, we get questions, uh, is it ever uh, a situation of design where I could completely eliminate the ground fault protection, even required by 230.95, 215.10, or 210.13? I like to refer the user of the NEC to 240.13 uh, on page 100 and look at your items 1 and 3 and for a continuous uh, process of equipment uh, that you can't afford to go, uh, go down on you due to uh, uh, leakage current and so forth, uh, no you don't want to uh, let that happen. So 240.13 item 1 addresses that. It says, no, you would not have to have it there subject to the approval of the authority having jurisdiction 90.4. Now, the third thing is a fire pump. We don't want ground fault protection of equipment on a fire pump. We know a fire pump needs to operate to a failure in accordance with Article 695 I believe it is, and along with NFPA 20 that deals with fire pumps. Now, uh, kind of getting back now to this ground fault protection of equipment, uh, 230.95C as in car is the one that seems to be uh, asked a lot uh, pertaining to the requirements of 230.95C. Now, if you notice that there is a relay setting, and we have an illustration uh, that uh, illustrates that to you in Stockup's uh, uh, Electrical Design Book, Volume 1, and that's figure 9-44, and that's approximately on page 9-27, and it gives an uh, excellent uh, set of rules that must be followed when ground fault protection of equipment is required. Now notice in the illustration we have relay settings and it basically says relays may be set uh, from 0 to 1200 amp pickup and a fault of 3000 amps or more shall be cleared in uh, one second. So that, the, that is the basic rule. And then the overcurrent device, say it's a circuit breaker, 1000 amps or more in rating, uh, the voltage is uh, 482.77, and of course, you know, ground fault protection would be required there. If you have a disconnect capable of taking a 1,000 amps or more uh, type rated fuse, then ground fault protection would be required there, in my opinion, even if you uh, used a smaller size fuse. It's capable, if the disconnect is capable of handling a 1,000 a amp or more, then it should be uh, provided. Now, in the illustration, we pick up the window type ground fault protection, which is the uh, top-of-the-art type of protection we want. The donut 
type where you have the bonding jumper going through the donut from a grounded bar to an isolated bar, that's not the best uh, uh, because naturally you're returning leakage current over equipment grounds, conduit systems, metal, and so forth uh, that, uh, that, that you could lose uh, some of the uh, current there, I think. But the window type's good because it, it, it magnetizes the current uh, as it goes through the window and as it returns, it demagnetizes as long as you do not exceed the setting. Now, we'll just give an example. Say you had a setting of 200 amps. Well, if leakage current from L1, L2, or L3, either one of those phases exceeded 200, then the window type's going to open it up because it doesn't demagnetize uh, the system as required by 230.95 along with 215.10 and 210.13 for feeders and branch circuits. But this kind of gives you a overall requirement of uh, 230.95, 215.10, and 210.13. Along with where you can eliminate it in accordance with 240.13. Now, the question comes in some authorities require a written procedure and testing done by a qualified person, others require it to be done by an electrical engineer, uh, some don't even require it at all. What is the deal here? Well, what is the real deal of this requirement? Well, I believe if you read very carefully, 250.95C is car, there on page 96 of your code book, starting on the left-hand side of the page, you'll pick up the rules. And I think, yes, you're supposed to have it uh, tested by a qualified person in accordance with the interpretation of this rule by the authority having jurisdiction. He or she will come in and make this interpretation. But I believe the testing is required to be done by a qualified person and presented to the authority having jurisdiction. Now, I hope that uh, this information will be important to the designer, the installer, maintainer, or the authority having jurisdiction. Uh, we should be on the same page here. Because if something goes wrong and uh, equipment is burnt down in any reason due to this leakage current, then we have a problem. The other question that comes in, why is it even required? Because the voltage to ground is over 250 volts to ground, and you have a restrike voltage. And as the uh, restrike occurs, it just builds up resistance. And then, of course, you know, uh, if we do not have this ground fault protection provided, there's no way to detect it. The overcurrent device at 1,000 amps or more rated just reads it maybe as a, an increase in current, and we're not clear if we do not have ground fault protection of equipment provided with the appropriate setting. As a rule now, back in, when I was a young fella and uh, working for a firm, we would set it at 10%, of the overcurrent device rating. Say if it was 2,000 amps, we'd take 10% of 2,000, we'd set it at 200. If it uh, nuisancely tripped, we would go to 15%. If it tripped again, we would go up to 20% of the overcurrent device rating. If it still tripped, then we would call the manufacturer at that point because uh, IEEE had a paper that said we should do that. And the manufacturer, uh, if I recall, my, 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 excuse me, if my memory is serving me correctly, uh, uh, would state, if you go more than 20%, call us. We'll come out, look at the equipment, see what the problem may be. So this was one way that uh, even, and I'm not saying that this lines up particularly with the code, but maintenance people today still use that concept. If somebody got in there and messed up the setting, they would use this 10%, 15%, and 20% rule, and then if they had problems, they would check with a manufacturer. Now, I'm not, that's a rule of thumb. So we have to uh, get in touch with the authority having jurisdiction and see exactly 
how they're going to enforce this rule according to state rules, county rules, city rules, in accordance with the NEC or electrical ordinance that has special rules pertaining to ground fault protection of equipment as outlined in 230.95 for services, 215.10 for feeders, and 210.13 for branch circuits, and then of course 240.13 items 1 and 3 where it could be completely eliminated in accordance with the permission of the authority having jurisdiction.